Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Underwood. I work in community engagement at the Missouri Historical Society. And on behalf of MHS, I want to welcome you all to STL History Live today. And thank you for joining us virtually for Drawing History with Rory. We're going to take a look at some of the fantastic illustrations in the Beyond the Ballot exhibit with artist and illustrator Rory. Um, safety is a top priority, so all of our programming is virtual right now, but the Missouri History Museum is open uh, Wednesday through Sunday with several safety precautions in place. We'd love for you to visit if you feel safe doing so. Uh, advanced reservations are required to visit any of the Missouri Historical Society locations. That includes the museum, also our library and research center, and uh, Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Uh, and you can visit mohistory.org to plan your visit and reserve free tickets. Today's program is being presented in conjunction with the exhibit Beyond the Ballot, St. Louis and Suffrage. And it's presented by Wells Fargo. I want to thank them for their support. And I also want to thank Emerson, who is our education sponsor. I know that some of you watching are Missouri Historical Society members, so I also want to thank you. Uh, we are so appreciative of your support. If you're not a member, um, we'd love for you to consider joining today, and you can find out more information about our membership program at mohistory.org backslash support. And we also want to sincerely thank everybody in the St. Louis City and County region for your tax contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District. Uh, just a couple quick things before we get started. Our STL History Live series runs up twice a week usually, uh, Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We also have Soldiers Memorial Challenge Chat programs, which happen on Wednesdays at noon on a monthly basis. Uh, you can visit the events calendar at mohistory.org or on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page to get the full lineup of all the programs that are coming up. And if you can't make it to any of them, don't worry, because um, most of them are posted to the Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel as well. So you can always go back and catch them there. And uh, please be sure to give them a thumbs up if you do that. They're always posted within a week. Uh, and then finally, we want to get some feedback from you today. So you'll notice at some point during the program, a survey is going to pop up. It's called a Kobo Toolbox Survey. It's going to open in another tab in your browser. Um, so we just hope that you'll take a moment to fill that out and share your thoughts with us. All right, so we're going to get to it. I am so happy to have Rory with us today. She did all of the amazing illustrations for both the Beyond the Ballot exhibit and the book Groundbreakers, Rule Breakers, and Rebels, written by Katie Moon, who was the exhibit content lead. And of course, by the way, you can purchase that at the Missouri History Museum shop or on our website, again, mohistory.org. Um, and Rory has joined me on the screen. So she and I are just going to have a bit of a conversation today about um, her illustrations, the process for creating them. And if you have any questions for Rory, you can go ahead and just put those in the Q&A at any time. And we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can. So let's go ahead and get started. Rory, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about you and maybe your background as an illustrator. So how long have you been doing this? Kind of what got you started illustrating and maybe like what drew you in particular to this project? Well, I've been uh, drawing kind of my whole life. It was something that I took to really early. Um, I am a St. Louis born and grew up uh sorry i'm like i'm a little nervous <laughs> i'm not used to public speaking um uh i think it's just always been the way i have expressed myself um and so um i originally started uh college for fine art and it really didn't click um, and I was lucky enough to to have an instructor that was like, hey, why don't you check out commercial art? Why don't you check out graphic design and illustration? And I was like, yeah, this is this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, and it's just gone from there. Um, I started college here at um, St. Louis Community College Merrimack. And I finished up at um, Columbia College in Chicago um, and then moved back here to St. Louis. And well, what was um, it about this particular project where you, did you always do kind of historic illustrations or was this something new for you? Um, 
I have been doing historic illustrations um, probably since 2012, I started uh, really doing it. Um, history has always been something I'm really interested in ever since I was like a little, little kid. Mm -hmm. um, and especially women's history, I always looked to history to find um, role models. Uh, so yeah, it's just something that, that I've always loved. And when I saw the call for this, I was like, well, this is perfect. <laughs> this, this is exactly me. Um, and I was, it, it's funny because there's actually a friend of mine who forwarded the call to me and was like, I think this project has your name on it. Um, <laughs> So oh, it literally does have your name on yeah. it. <laughs> so, so thank you, Andrea. Because um, otherwise I, I, I would not have, have known about it. Um, so, yeah. Well, we're glad you found out. We thank Andrea too then, because we're glad you uh, applied for it. And um, the illustrations you created are beautiful. And I wanted to, we can go ahead and get, I'm going to switch the slide here. So just to start us off with like, the very beginning, like what was the, I, this is the color palette, right? That we were working, that you were working with, with our exhibit designer? Uh, yeah, I was, I was working with um, Emily and, um, you know, when we started meeting, they had uh, picked out or uh, the, the colors for the exhibit. And since uh, the, the illustrations were going to be so prominent. I mean, they're, I don't know, like seven feet, eight feet tall. Bigger than life Maybe. size, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, they're huge. Um, and so they're very much a part of, of the color scheme. So it was very important to um, create illustrations that did not clash. Mm -hmm. and, you know, complemented the, the rest of the colors in the exhibit. So it would feel very, um, very whole. So once you knew kind of what you were working with color-wise, what was the next? I know we have these images of sort of mock-ups. Is that the next step or what? <laughs> How did that work? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, because we, you know, the, the thing about it is like the background color is so prominent that was something that we knew we really wanted to figure out. Like, do we want to have kind of this rainbow of colors, you know, purples and greens and blues, and or do we want to settle on one color? Um, and while I was doing this, uh, I was also starting the kind of initial sketches. Mm -hmm. um, so the yellows were, were looking really good in those. So we settled on, and also yellow is... A, a prominent color in in suffrage, especially with like um, the uh, the golden umbrella parade um, that's in the second part of the exhibit. So it it felt right to do these these golden yellow colors. We have some. This is a little bit more of a finished look at the mock-ups, I think. Yes, and so this was as. I was getting the sketches and you can kind of see, um, generally in my process, I usually don't do color this early um, unless it is part of a larger project where um, the color is really integral to, to the piece. Mm -hmm. um, so here it was important to, to lay out the colors in the order that they were going to um, be in the exhibit so that um, for one thing, everything kind of flowed nicely visually, but also so that no one was too similar um, aside another similar um, subject because there, there is a little bit that um, we have a lot more diversity of clothing styles, right? You know, in, in, modern, in the modern era and it was a very similar silhouette um, in, in this time period that we're working with. So that was definitely um, 
an important thing to consider. And we have a question, actually, we're going to come back to it. I just want to acknowledge we got a question in the Q&A about how you stylize faces and if you used multiple images. And we're actually going to dig in in a minute to like four specific women that you drew. Um, some of them you had no images for. So um, we'll get to that. And But I did want to just show we have a couple of images of you drawing. And I actually, I don't think this is one from the gallery, right? This is one that you're... Yes, this is uh, from... This is Martha Gellhorn from the book. Okay, wonderful. So there's a couple of pictures kind of early in the sketching and then uh, colorizing that picture. And so let's go ahead and dig in. Um, the first one we have is Francois Leduc and you can see if, if there was a picture of the woman that you worked with, I will have that on the screen. So you can see that did not exist for Francois Leduc. And maybe you can talk about, and this is actually the first iteration of her. So maybe you can talk about your sort of early process with her working with no photo. Um, and then we'll get to the second version of her in a minute. Well, I was I was lucky with, with Francois because we do have some photos of um, like her grandchildren and great grandchildren, um, which is something I've used before. Um, I did a series called 100 Days, 100 Women uh, which was a hundred portraits. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot, like a lot of it is you, you just do not have any visual reference whatsoever. Um, but sometimes you do have access to, um, you know, uh, pictures of family. And that is really helpful because then you can at least say like, you can, you know, it's not certain. You, you can never, because sometimes people don't look like other members of their family, but you can at least make an approximation. And it's really important for me to, um, to make the faces look distinct um, because it feels like when you don't have the reference, the likelihood that you're going to get the face that looked exactly like them is, you know, about zero. So my, my view is make something that looks distinctive so that they look like a person um, rather than an amalgamation of people. Because I think that there is like, um, you, you can start to uh, put a distance between yourself and uh, the art and the, the subject, if it doesn't look distinctive, if it doesn't look like a person, then it just kind of starts to look like, you know, a logo or something. And since these are historical people, I'm sorry, I've lost, ah, there we go. Sorry, <laughs> I lost the, the video for a second, um, which, which is, sorry. <laughs> technical issues. Um, so that that is really important to me. And so I, I worked from these pictures of Francois. Um, also, you know, if you have access to um, the ethnic group, uh, pictures of the ethnic group that people belong to, you can kind of look at um, just general features. I mean, mm -hmm. you really can't completely generalize um, because humans are just that unique, but you can, you know, get an idea of what is common and you just pick, just. Well, and I'm so sorry to mean to interrupt, but I, I also wondered if, since we're talking about that a little bit, like, can you give a little bit of background? I know you're not, you're not a historian. We're not asking you to give a full story on, on Francois, but just a little uh, sentence or two about who she was. Um, well, she was one of the, the early residents of St. Louis. Um, she was uh, European and Osage, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And her uh, husband was as well, I believe. Um, and she actually owned property. She actually owned a fair amount of property here um, and was one of the community builders of, 
of early St. Louis. Um, and kind of importantly is that she did own her property jointly with her husband. Mm -hmm. And like when we have proof of that because when they sold their property, she had to agree to it. Um, and in the, in the, in both drawings, there's like, she's, she has like a little uh, pouch, a little money pouch, which I included to kind of just symbolically indicate that she had control over her finances, mm -hmm. which was something that um, most European women did not. And I had mentioned at the beginning when we pulled this up that this was the first version of the drawing. Can you talk about um, why we why you ended up doing a second version of it? Yes. Um, so this first version was uh, based on um, a lot of, well, for one thing, like um, uh, Von Fuhl's watercolors of kind of the fashion that people wore in, in early St. Louis and other research. Um, and once it was completed, um, Katie ran it by um, some members of Francois' family, as well as the Osage Nation. And they gave me like invaluable feedback about what she was more likely to wear, mm -hmm. um, which when you're doing this kind of illustration, those kind of resources are they're truly invaluable to have people who who really know the subject because it you know you can do exhaustive research and still if you have someone who has that cultural knowledge, right, they're gonna give you more. So here's the the next sketch version. And then there's the final version. So I noticed like that a lot of changes actually, colors and the wrap and her hat. Uh, yes, the hat was changed to um, a little more of the, the Brittany bonnet that was common uh, at the time. The, uh, the method we we settled on for the women that we had no idea what they looked like mm -hmm. was to do this kind of um, head covering, which was pretty easy because everyone wore hats up to like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, and have this, this kind of shade on the face so that you have a face um, that you can, as a human, identify with, but it's still shaded. It's still acknowledged that this isn't um, necessarily representative of what they, in reality, look like. Got it. And so you can see, like, all of the changes. Like, um, they sent me some reference photos of the exact type of uh, moccasins that she would wear. Um, and the, the kind of blanket wrap was very important as well. Uh, she's also wearing silver earrings mm -hmm. uh, that they sent me reference for, which was excellent. Um, and so, and then the colors changed just to get the balance right. Also blue was a very common color for um, that colonial era. era. In, in France. Cool. So let's move on, unless you have something else you want to say about Ms. Francoise, we can move on to the next illustration. And the next woman is Adeline Weston Cousins. And so this is, this one you did have an inspiration photo for. So this is the picture you were working with. And did you use other photos or did you really focus on a single photo? Um, I always try to find as many photos as possible um, because, I mean, I, I, it's no secret that one photo doesn't really show who you are mm -hmm. um, and, and it doesn't even really necessarily show your features well. Um, I mean, even video 
uh, there's distortion. Like there's always some kind of distortion with a lens. Mm -hmm. And um, there's actually different types of distortion with different lenses. Um, it's fascinating. But uh, the, so I try to find as many photos as possible, as many drawings as possible. Um, sometimes if there's photos and drawings that are drawings from life, that can be really informative because I can see what another artist kind of took away from their features mm -hmm. and their personality. Uh, whereas, especially at this time, photos were a little bit of an arduous process. Like you were sitting for, you were sitting still, very, very still for a, a long bit of time. So everyone generally looks kind of grumpy <laughs> um, and generally they're not um, holding their face there. It's like uh, a neutral face mm -hmm. because the idea of holding a smile for an entire minute while you're perfectly still, you know. Um, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I try to use the photos as, as a starting point just to just to see the structure of the face. Well, and so there's, this is kind of your, I think this is kind of your first sketch of yes. outline. And then we'll bring the final image up. So that's where you landed with that. So there's the progression from photo to illustration. And then we'll bring it up just the, the full illustration because I know this one has a lot of detail in the background um, that you also used to convey part of her story. Yeah, all of almost, yeah, all of the backgrounds have a little bit that I try to either be symbolic or portray something from their life. Um, and this is uh, a snow covered Civil War battlefield where she got frostbite um, while she was tending to the wounded. And it was, <laughs> it, it was interesting when I did this one because I sent it in and I'm like, is it okay to have, to have a battlefield? Is that too much? <laughs> um, but there's not, you know, it's not gory or anything. There's, I kind of implied that there was maybe some, some bodies wrapped up because it is a civil war battlefield mm -hmm. and they were bad. Um, animals are no joke. Uh, so um, yeah, I, you know, you can even see the tree, um, in the background is is very gnarled, uh, which often happened. Um, there's there's actually like early photos of of Civil War battlefields, not for the faint-hearted, um, but it is it is interesting that when we think of that time, that there is is photography of it. Mm -hmm. And so she was a nurse on the on the battlefield. Is there anything else about her story that? we should share right now. <laughs> um, she also was on um, medical ships uh, that were riverboat or riverboats, I should say, not ships. Um, <laughs> uh, they had hospital riverboats um, that they tended the wounded. And that was where she spent generally most of her time. Um, I did look at pictures of the hospital riverboats and I'm Unfortunately, there was, a, they, they don't necessarily look in the interior like it's necessarily a riverboat, mm -hmm. um, unless you know what that looks like. And I already had, um, uh, the, the portrait of Mary Meacham had a steamboat in the background. So I didn't wanna just put one in the background, which would be similar. And also her getting frostbite on you know, because she's very dedicated is, you know, kind of awesome of her and, you know, very nurse-like. So um, I felt like that illustrated, you know, her tenaciousness and her dedication. Although she also got wounded on a riverboat. So she was just like, you know, it, it is it is something because a lot of the Civil War nurses had to fight really hard to get any pension. Sometimes they were given a pension and then it was taken away. Sometimes they never got it. 
um, and they were they were in harm's way, and they were integral in you know saving lives during the war. Um, so it's good that nowadays we recognize that. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was not so much recognized um, in the Civil War. Well, hopefully it's uh, getting recognized a little bit now through the exhibit also and looking back and, and that's the whole point of the exhibit, right? Recognizing all these great women who, right. um, whose names, many of whose names have fallen, you know, out of the, out of the popular imagination. So um, although some of the names you'll certainly have heard, probably not the next woman. Uh, her name is Priscilla Henry. And again, we did not have a photo of Priscilla. So this is just the, the early version of the sketch. If you want to talk about who Priscilla was and maybe how you got started with her uh, illustration. Well, Priscilla was um, actually uh, born into the uh, American chattel slavery institution. Uh, she was born in 1829 in Alabama. And um, she ev eventually worked her way up to St. Louis. I, it's, it's one of those things where um, oftentimes there is very sparse details of someone's life. Um, so you just have to kind of think about what generally happened. So she, she was probably emancipated after the war, but I don't know for sure. Um, but she, she came to St. Louis and uh, started up a brothel business. So she was a proprietor of brothels or as they are sometimes called body houses, mm -hmm. um, which were quite popular uh, as Big you can business. imagine, there was, there was a little bit of Vegas in St. Louis at the time. Um, and uh, she, she actually owned, uh, even though there was segregation, she owned both a, a white brothel and a um, black brothel that were side by side. And she made a ton of money. I think the estimate is that she probably had at least $2 million uh, to her name, modern, like, sorry, it was like 100, 200,000 back then, which would be like 2 million today. So she was the equivalent of a millionaire today. Um, and for four years, uh, prostitution was actually legal in a certain section of St. Louis. Um, so she was able to um, operate Un, fairly undisturbed by the law. Um, and she was, as far as the reports go, she was, you know, fairly well liked. Um, I was lucky enough to have a description of her from a police blotter, um, which was quite sensationally written, um, as most things, as most news was at the time. Uh, about a, a scuffle that happened. And it described her, I believe, as uh, stout and saddle colored, which is rude. Um, I don't think any woman wants to be compared to any kind of leather. Um, but uh, that at least gave me an idea that um, she was probably, you know, a, a physically a bit broad and it gave me an idea of the shade of her skin color. And actually, well, let's go ahead then. So there's the sketch with some shading. And again, you've got the, the shaded face under the hat, like we had with Francoise. And then there's the, <clears throat> excuse me, the final version of the illustration. And we can go to the, to the full screen version of that to take a look again. So there's and there's actually, there's, there's fairly um, good reference out there for Victorian era clothing. Mm -hmm. um, I actually put her in something a bit fancy, um, fancier than would be normal day wear. Because um, I felt like there's, 
sometimes a little bit of defiance in being dressed boldly, especially mm -hmm. in um, a very restrained society and a very stratified society uh, like she was living in. And it seemed like she was a very bold person, uh, maybe even a bit intimidating in her confidence. So I wanted to express that not only with her pose, but that she would wear finery and it would be a bit of a defiant finery. Like I'm not going to fade into the background just so you don't have to acknowledge that I exist. <laughs> And you had mentioned previously um, about working with a particular color scheme also. I don't know, uh, when we chatted before, you talked about some of the colors having to kind of maybe move away from, like slightly away from what would have been the most realistic color palette to like fit with the exhibit and make sure everything was aligned. And I don't know if that was the case here, but I'm curious about that. Uh, yes, definitely. I um, There were, you know, um, kind of mauve and, and purple dresses um, that was a popular color. Um, but I don't, they, they weren't quite as, as bright. Um, and that is a bit of license is a lot of the clothing is a bit brighter than it would have been or a bit, you know, richer, you know, there was not the there, there were very bright colors, but they were often um, very expensive. Um, like there's famously the the arsenic green, mm -hmm. um, which which poisoned a bunch of people, but it looked great, you know. Um, but you know, it was also very expensive. So, no suffering for fashion on that one, right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll move. From <laughs> the, the Victorian era was sadly all about um, accidentally poisoning yourself for fashion. <laughs> There's a program in that I think we need to do. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll move from Priscilla to uh, somebody whose name probably most people, at least in the St. Louis region, know, which is Annie Turnbow Malone. So another woman who was an entrepreneur who made millions. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about her story. And here, obviously we did have, I know we had multiple photos that you were able to work from with Annie. Yes, uh, that was excellent because there are tons of photos of Annie in, um, you can see her face from all different angles. You can see her um, in at, at several ages. There aren't a lot of younger photos of her but definitely from middle age on. Um, and this was kind of nice too, because I was able to give her this um, uh, boxy 1920s drop waist silhouette, which I had been, you know, mostly working with um, the Victorian hourglass type silhouettes or even, you know, the Edwardian, mm -hmm. which was a little bit looser but still very much, you know, a pinched waist. So it was, it was really nice to get another silhouette in there. Um, and she was, I mean, she was an incredible businesswoman. She made so much money, like incredible amounts of money that she gave away. Like she was, she was truly a philanthropist. It is, I mean, she should be up there with, you know, Andrew Carnegie as someone who made a ton of money and then gave it away. Um, I think a lot more people should know about her. She um, made her money in the beauty business and specifically products uh, for black women's hair. Um, and uh, a name that may be more nationally familiar, uh, Madam CJ Walker actually started out working for her and maybe a little bit uh, <laughs> took some of her recipes and modified them, um, you know, uh, but they weren't copyrighted. So that's how she ended up um, starting the, the Poro uh, brand 
is to initially copyright her work. Um, and then it, it ended up just being something where she, she opened this, the, the, the Poro College, which in the sketch you can see there is, um, I was going to put that in there and then it just mm -hmm. felt too busy because you know you want the focus to be on the um, the subject and not too much the background um, and I felt like it was just getting too busy and I also felt like having this column that said Poro kind of symbolically said that this was a thing that she built right you know because columns hold things up right oh and here we'll get a closer up look at the at the beautiful final illustration here. And she and there's I mean there's some I, I think that it's maybe not known where Poro comes from. There's some talk that it is um like a um a, a Mende word, which is like from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. Uh and then there is some talk that it was just uh, the first two uh, letters from her and her sister's last names, which at the time was Pope and Roberts, which also makes sense, um, but it's mystery. It's mysterious. <laughs> so well, we don't know. If anyone wants to go back, uh, oh gosh, it was fairly early in the pandemic. We had a virtual program looking at the sort of Hollywood versus history with the movie that had come out about uh, C.J. Walker and the story of Annie Malone, and we've got um, a program on that. So if you're interested in Annie Malone's story, I would definitely encourage you to go back and check out our STL History Live playlist on YouTube, Then you can find a really great program looking at that history and perhaps what the relationship was between those two women um, and how it's been mythologized and, and maybe what the reality of it was. So you can do that. And those are the four women we're talking about today, but I wanted to share, we had hoped to do a live demo of the drawing and the cameras just weren't cooperating with us to get that set up. But Rory did send me this um, little time-lapse video. So I'm gonna show this. And again, this is not a woman who's in the gallery, but she is in the book. This is Josephine Baker. And Rory, if you could just talk us, maybe tell us what we're seeing as we are watching the video, I'm gonna go ahead and start it. Okay, well, this is on a larger display. This is my at home desktop display. And I'm using a program called Clip Studio. Um, it is an excellent program um, that I highly recommend. It's fairly affordable, um, but it is just wonderful for getting very natural ink outlines. Um, before I started doing digital drawing, I, um, I worked primarily with uh, ink and brush. And so this was the thing that really allowed me to get into to digital drawing because I felt like it could most recreate that feel. Like nothing can quite recreate um, that because there is something when you're when you're drawing traditionally you know it's all about like the tooth of the paper and and there's just all these little happy accidents that happen but this is a very good program um, and as you can see uh, I'm able to use a stylus to draw directly onto the screen um, and if you look like to the side, you can kind of see these little, little swatches and those are all the brush options for many, many brush options. I usually only use about five of them, but I have like, I don't know, a hundred uh, because that's how artists are. <laughs> um, and underneath you can see this blue sketch, um, which is how I start out. You know, I get the, the sketch right. And then I usually turn it blue. Um, you can turn it any color you want. <laughs> I'm just used to doing it blue because I used to work traditionally. And when you work traditionally, generally you use like a blue pencil because it doesn't pick up in a scan as, okay. 
easy as other colors. It, it's specifically non-photo blue, which is from way back in production history where when they photograph the art, the specific color of non-photo blue would fall out. So you would just get the crisp black lines. Cool. So this is the finish. This is before color, but the finished product of the sketch, which is yes. beautiful. And you can, of course, see the colorized, the full color version of it in the book, um, Ground Breakers, Rule Breakers, and Rebels, which I own. And all of the illustrations look beautiful. It's 50 women. Uh, there's 32 women in the exhibit and 50 women in the book. So there's a little bit of a shift from uh, each one. So you've got to see both. Um, and just a reminder, I'm gonna take us in a second so you can see what the exhibit looks like with the big, like we said, they're bigger than life size. I know we're looking at them on a screen, so it's hard to get the sense of the scope. And I'm gonna show you in a second, but just a reminder, if you have any questions for Rory, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And let's move forward. Here we go. So this is obviously not the finished exhibit. You can see walls exposed back here, but this is the process. This was right before the pandemic. <laughs> it was so close. They were getting it up because it was supposed to open it April 4th. Yeah, we of course had to delay that, but it is up yeah. now. And we did get to have a open it to the public finally. And so here you are, Rory, with there's Priscilla, who we talked about. She's right back there in the background. And of course, some other wonderful, you can see Mary Meacham, Susan Blow who you may know had the first public kindergarten, Anna Brackett. Can you remind me, do you remember Anna Brackett's story? Uh, Anna Brackett was um, a education reformer. Wonderful. And then Arsenia Williams, who was also an educator. And, I and, a, and a club woman, which is kind of a cool part of, um, of Black history that I think maybe is not is like a little bit talked about but not like super talked about but the the club women were it was it was clubs of um black women in america who got together to um develop their community but also to um politically organize um and in in areas of the country where after suffrage, um, Black women were allowed to vote, um, because as we know, there were a lot of, area of areas of the country where um, Black citizens were not allowed to vote mm -hmm. um, until, you know- Much later. <laughs> much later. Um, they very much like they, they very much swung elections with their organizations. The, the club women thing is like so cool. Like if you wanna just like start Googling it, you'll, you know, go down an internet hole and you'll be happy that you did. Happy that you did. <laughs> there really are so many cool stories. And I just, I've, I'm so impressed with how you brought those stories out in these pictures. And it really is something to see them. Like we said, larger than life size. I mean, these are like seven feet tall. <laughs> Uh, women, yeah. which I think also speaks to their, to the changes that they did make and the, the impact that they had on our community here in the St. Louis region. So I think having them that big really gives them the, the sort of weight, the historical weight and significance that they deserve. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there's often kind of a focus on kind of the, the really flashy, um, hero type figures of of history but um i love that this exhibit focuses on people who were doing you know small things that were huge mm -hmm. you know you you don't necessarily know their name but they helped to make the future you're living in right and let's give i'm gonna forward to the next. This is just a quick little, so you can get a sense for those of you who are watching of what the gallery sort of looks like. This is just a quick little spin around the exhibit. So you can see the clothes. There's Fanny Sellins. She was a union. It was wild to see them 
this big um because as you as you saw like i drew the size i drew them um <laughs> i mean i would i would zoom in like 800 <laughs> percent just just to make sure because i knew that they were going to be so big so um you know i wanted to make sure that there weren't any little weird gaps or you know things like that um which was very different because usually I draw stuff that is going to be much, much smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and we have actually somebody who's watching has a question about how long it took you to do all of these illustrations from start to finish from when you started planning with the exhibit team to this. Uh, it was several months, let me think. Um, four months? That's Maybe? actually an impressively short amount of time. I think I would have looking at it, I would think, gosh, it must have taken you a year or more because of all of the the detail that you put into and the thoughtfulness that you put into um, the clothing and the backgrounds and, and really trying to reflect um, their personalities and doing some of the research on their stories. And especially when you didn't have, how many women did you not have actual photos of do you remember um i want to say it was around it was between four and six so that i would imagine would take you know just these extra layers of research to try to get something approximating you know there's at least to get their spirit through right on a in an image i, th I think after um I mean, it, it was a lot of work. I think after doing um, the 100 Women series where I, I kind of cut my teeth on like how to really get to the deep research, mm -hmm. um, I think I maybe cut a little time off of that because there wasn't, um, you know, going down the dead ends as much. I got really used to, okay, this is, the search terms I need to use. This is how I need to use image search. This is, you know, where I need to dig. And you just kind of get an instinct mm -hmm. for it after so many. <laughs> we have a question about whether this was your, is this your first exhibit that you've ever done or have you done exhibit illustration before? Um, this is my first exhibit, which is very exciting. I, I couldn't pick a better first exhibit because I love everything about this. It's it's women's history and it's my hometown and it's giant <laughs> and colorful. <laughs> and yeah, this is this is blessedly my first exhibit. <laughs> Maybe not your last. We'll see. Hopefully not your last. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> well, these are just beautiful and I appreciate I'm going to take us forward a little bit on the slide so I can show I want to thank you for being here today. Oops, there we go. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to be with us today and kind of share the story, your story, and then also the story of all the women in the exhibit or some of the women in the exhibit. Um, just really cool to see how you did it. I loved it. It was really fun to kind of take this little tour with you. Um, I do want to thank again, of course, our Beyond the Ballot uh, presenting sponsor, Wells Fargo, our education sponsor, Emerson. I want to thank everyone who tuned in today. And if you're tuning in on YouTube later, thank you for doing that. Um, as I mentioned, you can, uh, if you are looking, watching live today, there's going to be a survey that pops up in your browser. So we would really appreciate you giving us any feedback you can on that. Um, and we've got a, two more programs coming up for the year in 2020. Excuse me, let me push this. There we go, just two more for 2020. And then we'll be back, of course, in 2021 with lots more. So I hope you can join us again. And uh, thank you so much again for being here, Rory and everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you thank so you. much.